Hello, welcome to uh, welcome to this microblaze session that we're going to be having having today, where we're going to be mastering uh, mastering the microblaze. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us uh, in the in this um, in the afternoon or the morning or the evening, depending upon where you are where you are in the world. We've got quite a quite an exciting session, I think, today uh, for you. We're going to be running over uh, a few uh, a few slides, and we're joined by. Uh, Romaisa Samhound, who is the uh, product line manager at AMD, and she's going to take you through some of the, the in-depth technical details of uh, of Microblaze. Uh, and then I'm going to then I'm going to take over from Romaisa, and we're going to run through a lab, and we're going to show you how you can get a um, Microblaze system up and running from scratch. Uh, in in the um, on, I'm going to be using this SP701 board. Uh, Probably blurred. I'll turn my background off blurring, but somewhere you can see it just here. Uh, and we have it all up and running. It's going to be a really simple. It's a really simple demo, but it's going to be a really nice one to just to show you how to get up and how to get up and running with it, and give you the confidence uh, to to do that and to get started. So I'm going to pass this over to uh, to to Remisa, and she's going to take you through. Uh, the first half of it. I'll try and answer any questions we go as we get them in the chat. Please feel free to uh, feel free to free to pop them up and start talking. And Ramisa, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Adam, and thanks everyone for joining. I'm Ramisa Samhud, and I'm a products line manager here at Xilinx, AMD Xilinx. Allow me to share my screen quickly. And we will get started right now, right away. It's sharing. If you just want to maximize the slides, then we should be able to go. Awesome. So you can see that now. Alrighty. So um, I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you for having me, Adam. And thank you for joining us today. And um, today we'll cover the Microblaze processor introduction and deployment, the operating system and how the Microblaze communicate with external peripherals, and as well as Adam will take us to um, a quick demo. So Adam will create a really good um, workshop live based on the Microblaze processor. And then we will share the available Microblaze collateral and the next steps that you can follow after this webinar. So let's get started. So first, our Microblaze introduction. So not everything we in, in this parallel world is, needs to be parallel. So we still need sequential processing in, in the parallel world when everything is going so rapid with the programmable logic that is so good for parallel and data processing. And it's good as well for the high-speed interfacing and rapid acceleration. But there is still the need for some applications that require sequential processing. And part of these applications are the um, communication and human interfacing, like the touch screen that we're using nearly every day, and the flow control, like the control of the sequence of a system. So what is the Microblaze and how is, is it used? So Microblaze is a soft processor. It's used in all of our AMD devices, and it's um, this. It have the processor capability that depends on the performance and type of peripheral that you need, as well as the operating system support, the tool, the cost point, and many other things. So, in the cost optimized portfolio, there are a breadth of devices and families that we have, and each of which have a differentiating hardware capability. So to go briefly over our products, so we have the Spartan 7, which offered the best performance per watt, the low cost and the smallest packaging, the um, Artex 7 that provide the uh, transceiver performance for high speed serial connectivity like the HDMI and the Zinc for the system integration, like um, integrating a full hardened ARM processing subsystem with the FPGA lo logic. Also we have the Zinc Ultrascale Plus and PSOC, and um, this is um, this allow us to use the heterogeneous multi-processing platform for broad uh, for broad range of embedded applications. 
And finally, our latest and greatest, the Versal, it's our adaptive compute accelerator platform. So as we can see here on the screen, so in nearly all of our devices, we have the MicroBlaze processor, and it's a 32-bit capable risk-based processor. It's a soft IP implemented in the FEG fabric, and um, it, it, it gives so much flexibility to our users in terms of like having the variety of um, either to use a soft processor or whether they, they require the hard processor with the Zinc and Versal families. So uh, this this really depends on the application and um, and also um, it it depends on the the range of of the use models that you can use. So next to highlight what is the microblaze and give a little bit details about that and what is the microblaze configurations. So the microblaze is it, it could be used um, as a main processor or it could be used as a supplemental processor or a co-processor like what we saw in the previous slide as in Zinc and the Versal. And uh, this processor can be completely customized to meet the need of a specific design model. So um, it, it can be used within different configurations and um, these configurations that we'll go over right now are three configurations. The first one is the a, the microcontroller, and this is typically running from an internal or external memory with the number of low performance peripherals. The second configuration is the real-time processor, and this is for systems that requires a deterministic response. So microblaze here comes really handy to be configured as real-time processor with the R2 supports. And third and finally is the application processor supporting embedded Linux. And uh, we also give you the uh, flexibility to run all of this in lockstep for temper resistance and fault protection. And Microblaze is also triple mode redundancy capable for critical cases where the, when the circuitry cannot go down. And the t so here comes the TMR that provides the single event upset and the Voter, um, single event upset mitigation, as well as the voter circuit here, allow the system to recover and resynchronize and bring the system back. Um, so it's it's also so important to worth noting that our microblaze is 100% free, and it's also uh, without any royalties. So um, in this. And in this slide, I want to share more about what are the Microblaze processor software solutions. So we just shared that we have the um, OS Linux, the free Artos, the standalone bare metal, but that's not only the three profiles that we have here. This is not a fully exhaustive list of all what we can support, but um, we, we also support third party operating systems. And to name a few of them, we support the INEA OSC, which is a robust, high performance real time operating system. We support the um, Express Logic um, that I learned that it's now the Azure Artos and the ThreadX Artos that is now the um, Azure Artos ThreadX. And finally, the Micro C uh, OS, which is also a real time operating system that is intended for the use of embedded systems. And um, let's think about how, um, how fast this microblaze can run. So it, um, it depends really on the configuration and also depends on the device and the speed grade. So the faster the speed grade, the better the performance we can get from the microblaze. This is the um, architecture and building blocks of the microblaze, where the white blocks here enables, are enabled by default for both presets of the microcontroller and real time. Um, the blues um, building blocks here are for the application processor, but the um, customers have the flexibility to select any building blocks and enable it by the, um, whether they need it for their application. And this allows really good um, customization and flexibility. It's um, on on the slide also here we have the uh, that the microblaze is based on um, fully Harvard architecture. It's based on the it it does have 32 bits instruction set as well as 32 bits uh, that is extensible to 64 bits address bus. 
and um, it supports a floating point unit and also the sleep hibernate and suspend models and instructions. To go over quickly a high level benefit of the microblades. So uh, we do have here an efficient architecture. We'll cover it in more details in the next slide. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. So the microblades can be um, used as a three stage pipeline, five stage or more, um, more complicated as an eight stage. And this really depends on the um, the configuration, the flexibility of the application and the optimization that is needed, whether it's in size or it's in performance or it's in frequency. And um, with this flexible configuration, um, Microblaze does have a three main um, presets configuration with seven additional, so total of 10 configuration templates that we have in our tools. And we, we also support uh, memory management unit and we have a floating point unit with the um, with the AXI for support as well. Um, so the microblades have been in production since 2001. So it's a really mature um, processor that we support in our tools. It's supported in all of our devices and um, it comes free with our tools as well. To, to give you a quick um, details here about the um, the embedded, how, how microblades can fit in embedded applications. So this really depends on how we will choose the preset. So um, for each configuration, so we, we're giving you the flexibility to change the pipeline stages to optimize for area or for performance or both. And um, as the pipeline increase, the efficiency of every uh, processor increases as well. So, um, here, here it shows that between the microcontroller to the application processor, this, the footprint is increasing and the complexity is increasing as well as the operating system support um, is not supported in the microcontroller while it is in the application processor. So um, again, it's the configurability and the adaptability of our microbase solution. So what does this comes to uh, when um, when we're using it in our application? We can see like this is just a few applications that we can use microblades in, like the in industrial and in automotive and consumer communication. This is just a few examples of the um, applications that or the markets that microblades can contribute to. And for the applications, it could uh, could be used in motor control and GUI and communication and um, command and control and so many much more applications than that. All right, so we completed the first section, which is the introduction. So next, let's see how we can deploy the microblaze. So um, we've got so many options for the microblaze memory to, that users can use. And um, what, one of these is the uh, local memory and the BRAM. So uh, we have a BRAM uh, with the local memory that we can use it with the local memory or the external memory with the DDR for more complex uh, solutions. We also have the shared memory that we can use with another processor when, for example, when we're using the microblaze with an ARM. And for the interfaces, we have um, many interfaces um, for the microblaze. The main one is the AXI4, and this provide a faster, um, faster for streaming and communication, as well as um, it also supports 16 AXI4 stream interface ports. And um, and the second thing is the um, the ACE interface, and this is the coherent interface that provide the cache coherence for connections to the memory. And if the application requires um, more uh, like it's using one or more microblades then the lock stack interface comes um comes into play uh where it's designed to connect the primary to um microblades or if you're using multiple ones it connects them all, all the instances together we also have two more interfaces here the debug interface which um when we will get to that in detail later when uh, we talk about the microblades debugger and the trace interface, this is the profile of the application that where we track what is running through the application. So um, we will get into the microblaze debugger in the next few slides. 
These are also considered as interfaces, the local memory where the local memory interface, where the local memory is where the application is and to um, run our program either uh, from the internal local memory or also if the application is big, we can run it from the DDR. And this also depends on whether um, um, on whether it's running it using the IP or not. So we have a couple more um, interfaces like the instruction cache and data cache, as well as the clock and reset interfaces. For the microblaze, it's um, for its clocking and interrupts. It does have single input clock. Um, here on the example, and what Adam will go later in de more details for the um, demo is. Um, we, we're using here on the screenshot, this is a microblaze um, use, using uh, a classic implementation where you can see that the memory interface generator is providing the system with the main clock. And uh, the DDR um, for this application was running at 400 megahertz while the microblaze is running at 100 megahertz. So it's double the speed of the microblaze. So um, this gives uh, the best interface and the best throughput and uh, the processor also can do the interrupt handling for multitasking purposes. So here comes the AXI interrupts usage. For the for building and configuring a microblaze, it uh, depends on the application. So if the um, if this if it's a small application, then the VRAM will start up and will start running. If it's a large application, then the bootloader will fetch the application from the non-volatile memory and run it on the DDR, such as the microblaze will basically run from the DDR. And um, we also have the bootloader that um, that could um, that could be used with the large um, large application with the microblaze. For safety and security, Microblaze is lockstep capable, and this is an additional unique value that could be configured in the lockstep configuration in any of the previous profiles that we mentioned. And the triple mode redundancy uh, technology is also developed for SEU mitigation. And um, the block diagram here shows the example of the processor in um, TMR solution, the triple mode redundancy. We also have the XADC and the system monitor to monitor the device parameters and the device temperature. And uh, the XADC specifically to monitor the supply voltage for the device as well as the device temperature. Um, adding more to the safety um, and the safe communication of the microblaze. So the microblaze supports both the mailbox and mutex, and these are both um, used for the safe communication um, between the microblaze and other memories. So um, the mailbox is being used for safely passing the data between multiple processors, while the mutex um, is used if we have more than one processor, so it allows a synchronous synchronization between the processor and allow um, a safe sharing of data. And that's what almost all the application needs if there is um, more than one processor on the um, device. In the next few slides, I will uh, walk you over the microcontroller system, the microblaze, the MCS. So what is the microcontroller system? It's, um, you can think of it as a simple microblaze solution. So it's, um, it have a fewer configuration options and it's available in uh, Vivaru as an IP as well. So it's, it's, it, it really uh, adds the same microblaze performance and it's ideal for small applications, as well as it's ideal for new users to the microblaze. So um, think of it as you, you just have a, in Vivaru um, ML, you have a IP canvas that you can just drag and drop and use the available IPs. So, we, we will talk next about how easy it is to get started using Microblaze with our IPs and with our example designs as well. So <clears throat> the MCS, what does it include and what it doesn't include? So it uh, includes all the configurations, these three stages and the five stages. It also support, um, have a local memory support um, between four to 128 kilobytes. 
and it uh, it supports so many peripherals um, like the UARTs, the um, the GPIO, the the GPO, the general purpose in, input and general purpose output, as well as as well as the uh, simple I/O bus. What it does not support is the um, external memory access, the streaming data. So these are more complicated peripheral, but <clears throat> uh, this doesn't mean that you cannot use complicated peripherals with the MCS. You can actually um, use um, any peripheral with the MCS and you can uh, just integrate uh, whatever peripheral you like to the MCS. So, um, this is a quick comparison between the uh, MCS and the Microblaze processor. So the difference between them is that if you create your own MCS, you will need double the number of logic cells. The AMD Xilinx IP is, is really highly optimized. So it just needs um, 900 uh, logic cells. Unlike if you use, um, if you build it your own, you'll have 1800 logic cells. So that's, um, that shows how small and efficient the MCS is. And um, the logic cells here is uh, for configuring between two different modes. Next is the microprocessor debug module. So the, the Microblaze processor debug module. So we, um, we just highlighted in the beginning that we have a 10 presets configuration. So what are these? These are the uh, microcontroller, the real time, the application, as well as you have seven additional flexibility where you, uh, if you need in your system, like to minimize the area, the performance, the frequency, and uh, as well as more uh, applications um, with the, for specifically for Linux with MMU. And, um, and this gives you the flexibility <clears throat> to optimize on the performance, the area, the frequency, depending on the configuration. So how can we debug the microblaze? Um, this is, um, this debugging happens in Vitus. So our software, um, since our software might have some flaws, so um, debugging um, microblaze is an easy task here with the uh, MD MDM. So, all you need is just to um, have it in the hardware and it will be enabled in the software as well to, um, to be able to debug the microblaze. So you can, um, this um, MDM <coughs> supports um, the UARTs if uh, you do not have it in your main application. It also have um, the standard JTAG interface for the connection between Vivado, Vitus and the processor to communicate as well as the um, boundary scan and um, the JTAG um, really um, comes um, where, where the JTAG access um, the memory configuration of the AXI interface. In the next few slides, we will talk about the operating systems and configurations. So we mentioned that we can use uh, Microblaze as bare metal or uh, as an Artos or with Linux. So um, the microcontroller, this um, this is running at 1.1 DMIPS per megahertz, and it's running from the external memory um, with number of low performance peripheral. And in this slide, we're really comparing here between the microblaze and what is um, the equivalent to it from ARM. So the microcontroller is equivalent to M M0, M1, the real-time processor that is um, running faster at 1.3 DMIPS per megahertz, and this is equivalent to the M3, M4 processor, while the application processor, um, this is more uh, complex. It's uh, equivalent to the A5, the ARM Cortex A5 processor, and it's running at 1.4 DMIPS per megahertz. For the microblaze to externally communicate with other um, processors are peripheral. So um, in order to do that or memories, so it could be via a simple interface like the UART or more complex interfaces like the Ethernet. And um, all of our uh, IPs are supported in Vivado ML Canvas and the drivers of the Microblaze processor are also supported like the CAN, the I2C, the SPI. So it's just drag and drop um, if you are beginning your application with the Microblaze. 
for our tool support, we um, we mentioned that it um, it's free. We do have the Vivado ML edition, which is free, and the Vitus Unified Software Platform. So <clears throat> we do have these uh, free tools that support Microblaze with no charge, no licensing, no royalties. And um, also, uh, we, we have built-in templates that comes with the Vivado ML. And for Vitus, where um, Vitus is mainly used for to export the design, um, the hardware designs that we used in Vivado and to um, design the software implementation. Um, so as well as debugging, like using the uh, MDM that we just talked about and the, um, the breakpoints the, uh, and, and more, um, more opportunity to help with debugging the application. So um, the Microblaze, um, it could be used as a soft processor in um, Vitus, or it could be used as a co-processing as well as uh, this comes with um, heterogeneous debug and development with the Zinc and Versal ACAP as well. So I'm gonna give it back to Adam here and he will walk you over the our example designs and the great workshop that he created. All right, back to you, Adam. I'm still muted. Yep, uh, you are now. Hopefully you can still, hopefully you can hear me now and I'll stop rapidly typing away uh, on the um, on the answering, trying to answer things. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to create this little example and I'm going to, I'll just show you what it does at the moment. Uh, and we're doing really well in sort of in terms of time today. So we might, you know, we might, we might be about an hour or so and then we all get an hour of our day, of our day back, which would be, uh, which would be great. But I'm going to just bring this around here and put all this around here. So today we're going to create an example that's running on this. This is the SP70. This is the SP701 board, uh, but it would work on it would work on any Xilinx uh, dev board that you've got that's got a seven series, seven series and up, and at least one LED. Uh, and that's that's important because we're going to be driving uh, driving the LED today, uh, and we're going to be putting some PW, PWM into it and running that through. Uh, and changing, uh, changing the changing the PWM. So what we're going to do first. This is the project I had open, uh, but I'm going to close this project, and then we're going to go through it step by step. Now there is a few there is a few things, and the screen yeah the screen might be a little bit slow, a little bit the resolution might be uh, a little bit uh, a little bit out. And as I go through it, I will zoom in and I will show the. Uh, and I will show the um, show the um, show the IP blocks and everything that we're doing. So I'm going to do this in Vivado 2020.1, uh, and that's just because it happens to be the latest version that's on my that's on my machine. Uh, we can do it in in several uh, in several versions of uh, in any version of Vivado from post 2019.2. So to get started, I'm going to click on this level here called Create a Create Project. Uh, and we're going to create a new project. Now, one of the things that we could do with this is there are as several example applications that we could just use and that would automatically create a, create a microblaze. In fact, there are example applications that will run through and will automatically create a complex microblaze solutions, such as if you've got the SP701. You can use them to create complex microblaze solutions, such as um, such as imaging, or maybe if you want to do them, uh, such as uh, triple module redundancy. There are there are examples that will create you entire designs doing that. But I wanted to show you, I wanted to create an example where we start from the beginning, uh, and we and we take and we take the steps, uh, we take the steps through it. Um, I'm not sure if some people have some issues with the screen. I think. Um, I think it should be okay on the recording, and as we push into it, uh, as we move into it, I'll zoom in and pop things out such that you can uh, see. It. I can try to lower the resolution if that uh, if that helps. Just bear with one second. We can we can do that. Display settings. Uh, we'll drop the resolution 
down a little bit to that. And keep those changes. Maybe that makes a bit of a difference. Um, yeah, I see a lot of comments in the chat, Adam, about the font. So maybe if you can increase the font, that will be awesome. Yeah, we can change this. We can put some, perhaps if we did this. Oh, that sends it completely, um, completely crazy there. Um, because I did it on the wrong screen. Once, uh, one second. Uh, I, I, shaking backwards and forwards between the screens is never any. Uh, never any yeah, good, one it? one thing to add to this while you're bringing up this, Adam, is that um, we also have the step-by-step -step demo um, documented so you can follow along after the webinar that's, in your own pace. That's too that's too much for that. So let's let's drop that a little bit and see where it uh, see where it gets to. Okay, maybe that's a little maybe that's a little better. I don't know if you can see. Uh, yep. You can see what's going up now. Um, yep, looks good. Uh, and that should that should help a bit, and you can you can scr you can scroll it a little bit. So okay, so let's get started. So I'm going to create a create a new project, uh, and we'll do this. And I'm just going to call this uh, MV Live, just so as I know this is the one that I did uh, that I won that I did live. Uh, and at the end of this, somebody was just asking. At the end of this, you should be able to get all the video. You'll be able to get all the videos. You'll be able to get all the transcripts and everything. It'll all be uh, it'll all be live on there. And any any links will update in the uh, in the descriptions on on GitHub and everything. So as you can so as you can see. So I'm going to call this project uh, Microblaze Live, and we're going to call it. Uh, I'm just going to put it in my project area that I normally work in. Um, I'm going to create it next as a as a project type. We're going to say that this is a, an RTL project. But at the moment, I don't really have any IP, any IP that I want to add into. I don't have any custom RTL of my own uh, that I'm going to add in. So I'm just going to make sure that that's checked. And then once we come to this, I'm going to select the board that I want to target it for. Now, I'm going to go to the boards tab here, uh, and I'm going to select the Xilinx one. I'm sorry, it's a little slow when I ask it to select, uh, select these. I'm going to go to Xilinx. And then I'm going to go to SP701. Uh, and we'll see here we've got the SP701 evaluation board. If you're following along and you've got your own uh, and you've got your own board, then please feel free to uh, just select whichever one you want to uh, you want to work from. And what we'll do is we will click next on that. Uh, and we will click finish on that. And that should give it that should open us up a nice project once we've once we've done that. So we'll enter into our projects. I'm assuming that most people are familiar uh, with Vivado here and, and, and familiar with the, with, the, with the steps of it. But just to give you a quick, uh, a quick overview of it, you know, down, down this side, down the Flow Navigator here, we have everything that we need to be able to run simulations, uh, run the synthesis, run the implementation, generate the bitstream, and put it into the, uh, put it into the hardware. We can see our project summary here at the moment. It doesn't tell us much information as we progress on through it. We're going to see a little bit more information come out in terms of DRCs, timing, the utilization, and the power uh, and the power that it's taken. Uh, and we'll be get to and we'll begin to uh, get this uh, all all up and going. Now, as Ramaisa mentioned, we're going to create a block design. We're going to use the IP canvas to do this. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to create on. Um, Create block design. Uh, I'm quite uh, un normal in that I normally leave this just as we want to leave it, as just as it's suggested. If you want to give it any particular names, you can. Uh, but we will leave this as it's uh, as it's named now, and just click on OK. And this will take it. This will take a few few seconds, or maybe maybe because I'm showing my desktop, it'll take a few it'll take a few minutes. But it'll create us this here, this nice empty. Uh, this nice empty workspace essentially that we can uh, that we can work in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this out. Um, actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to pop this back in because we're going to we're going to drag some things on and off uh, from there. So what we get is we get this nice area. We get this IP IP integrator canvas, and over here we have the area where we can see the sources for our design. We can see all the signals in our design, and we can see we can see our design. 
most importantly, because we're using a known board, then Vivado is board, Vivado is board aware, uh, and such that we can see uh, we can see the uh, peripherals that are available on the SP701. Uh, so we can see the Ethernet configurations, the external memory, the GPIO, uh, the I squared C, the UART, and PMODs, and, and everything like that. So it's really, uh, really quite, uh, really quite nice because this is going to save us a lot of time and effort when we want to create solutions that work with our SP701. So somebody was just asking in the chat, uh, what's so special about Bravado ML? Can they use it with normal Bravado? Um, Yes, you can. Vivado ML, as far as I'm aware, is just the renaming of the later versions of Vivado because it includes some machine learning uh, elements uh, in it. In it, so it, no matter what version of Vivado you've got, as long as it's later than 2019.2, where they introduced um, Vitus, then you should be uh, you should be good to go and to follow uh, and to follow it along. Uh, so somebody was saying, if they, what do they do if, if they're using a custom board instead of an eval board? So that's a really great, really great question, actually. Uh, and if you've got a custom board, you'll not, you'll not obviously see, see, see this. We're going to use this today because it's going to, it's going to, uh, it's going to be easier for us. If not, then you've got two, you've got two options. The first option is this is all XML, so you could you could create your own and create your own custom board definition in, and, and add that to the Vivado board area. It, such that when you pull it up, it's always got the same things in there. Um, and also, the, but the other approach is if you're doing it like I am to, today, then you can you will you will be able to implement the IP uh, without you'll be able to implement the IP directly, but you'll have to pre-configure it by hand yourself. Uh, with no, with known configurations. Now that's not an issue for for this lab, apart from that we'll be using the memory interface generator to to use the DDR to do, use the DDR three. So if you're doing that by hand, that might take you a little a little while longer just to set it up for the DDR memory that you're that you're using. So to get started, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to click on this blue this uh, blue plus button in the middle, and we're going to type in microblaze. Uh, and we'll see this brings up the microblaze process here. Uh, you'll see that we also get the debug module, and we'll be we'll be adding that in a little in a little while. And we also get the MCS system, which Remisa was talking about talking about earlier on. Uh, if you if you're interested in the MCS system, because it is quite interesting, I wrote a blog on it a couple of weeks ago. I'd suggest you go uh, go go check it out. But today we're going to put a microblaze system in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to double click on this. And it's going to add us the microblaze, the microblaze in there. Now this is just the microblaze, and as Remisa said in her slides, we end up with ten potential configurations to this microblaze. And at the moment, it's not really configured at all. It's just got the basic, the basic interfaces around it. So it's got the, it's a, it's a Harvard architecture. So as you can see, it has the. Uh, the data, the data local memory bus, and the instruction local memory bus. We can see it's got a debug interface, standard clock resets, and of course, of course, an interrupt interface. But it's not really configured in terms of how much block RAM we want it to use for its local memories, whether we want AXI interfaces in it, whether we want additional floating point support or additional, additional hardware, software type things in there as well. So we're going to need to do that. And one of the quickest ways we can do this is by doing this and running what's called the block automation. Because this is one of the nice things about Vivado is it automates things for us and helps us work through it uh, and, and, and accelerates our development. Now, ordinarily at this point, I would be clicking, I would be clicking this button to run the to run the block automation. However, I wanted to create a system where we can either run from the block memory, the local block memory that's in, in block RAMs, or run from the DDR3 that's on that's on the board. And to do that, we need to add the DDR3. And it's and if we're planning on running the DDR using DDR3 in our applications when we create microblaze solutions, it's always better before we run the block automation actually to pull in the DDR the DDR3 memory. So what we're going to do is we're going to click this, uh, click the DDR3 memory on the on the board memory tab, and we're just going to drag it across here. And fingers crossed, we're going to hope it's all going to work okay. It worked several times today while I was practicing it, but. Uh, Always, when it gets live, things get a little things get a little bit more a little bit more challenging. But hopefully, what you will see is you will see this new 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 memory interface generator was added 
for the, for the design. Now we see two. Now we see two options. We've got the run block automation, which is configure the microblaze, and we've also got the run connection automation, which is connect the mic the MIG that we've just added into the system. Um, and that's that's really that's really quite nice. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to start configuring now our our mem our memory and our microblaze. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to now run this block automation and this is going to pop up a uh, pop up this dialog box that we can select from now you'll notice that we have the preset so we can have one of the presets if we if we if we want uh, in this option uh, i'm going to leave it as it as it stands i'm not going to select any particular preset i'm going to come down here and i'm going to say that i actually want 32 kilobytes of, of local memory my my, my, my C writing is not efficient. I'm an FPJ engineer, not a C engineer, not a, not a software engineer. Uh, so I want to make sure that we've got plenty of, uh, of, of local memory for me to write my C in if I want to. I don't want to have an ECC on it. This is not for safe critical application. Um, and the cache is also interesting because the cache would be implemented in programmable, in programmable logic as well uh, in the block rounds. And it's already running from it's already running from block RAM. So I'm going to turn. I'm going to say that I don't really want any cache. Now I do want to have some D. I do want to input a debug module, uh, and this debug module is going to allow it, allow me to connect and use JTAG to down, not only download the application into the into the board when we when we debug it, but also to do breakpoints and and stop, start, and, and observe variables and such like. So I do want to include this. And if I didn't, I am going to put a UART in. I am going to put a UART in here as well. But if I didn't have a UART, say my end system doesn't have a UART because there's no there's no core for it, there's no need for it, then I can use the, uh, we can also use this debug module to provide us the same UART functionality uh, within, um, within the, um, Within, within within the within our hardware design, uh, so somebody was just asking. Marty was just asking, is the TMR subsystem automatically configured? Um, and you can create a TMR subsystem quite easily if you. Um, I have some blogs on it. I think I'll, I'll I'll put them in the I'll put them in the links once I've stopped talking. But essentially, if you open the TMR manager, if you open a TMR a design with a TMR manager in it, uh, and you right click on that TMR manager IP and open the example design, it will create you a fully functional. TMR microblaze solution, and we've we've done this on some projects, and actually, uh, for, for I think it must have been the blog that we did it. We had it, we had this implemented and running in a RTS 750 board, so a fairly a fairly small sort of Spartan, and we could we could get that up and running. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna run from this uh, we're gonna run from this debug we're gonna have this debug module only. Uh, so somebody's asking about the ROM size for the for the microblaze. Uh, so the ROM is the ROM is we don't really use that. We use block memory as we use block memory that's pre-configured as, as ROM. Uh, so when we start our application, I'll talk about it in a little while. So it's this real it's this local memory size. So the maximum size that you can set it to is 128 uh, kilo is 128 kilobytes. Uh, and if you want larger than that, then you're going to have to interface to the uh, to the to the DDR. Uh, if you don't, if your board doesn't have DDR on it, then you can just run the block automation without having uh, without having the DDR connected to it. What we're going to do now, once we've got all this, we're going to have no pre we're going to have no presets. We're going to have 32 kilobytes of memory, no ECC, no cache, a debug module. We're going to enable this port. Uh, and, we're, and notice here that the clock connection is automatically being selected uh, such that we can pull in. The, that we're going to use the appropriate clock from the from the memory in from the memory interface. So I'm going to click OK on this. I'm going to sit and um, drink a uh, drink a cup of tea if I was working uh, while it creates a system. And now we see really the first element of our design beginning to come to of our design beginning to come to life. We have the microblaze here. Uh, we have the local memory that's being configured uh, just here. So we have the uh, the local memory bus to, to memory interfaces, um, and then we have the block memory the block memory here. Uh, we also have the um, we also have the dual port AXI, uh, the the data port for the AXI in, enabled. 
uh, we've got the memory inter we've got the MIG connected and we've got the uh, connected clock all the way running background uh, background background to background to that and this should really begin to give us um, begin to give us what we uh, what we want to do now one of the things that we needed to do was we needed to take the uh, the reset from here you will notice the microblaze uh, the microblaze reset uh, is connected to the, uh, to the to the reset and the reset handling block here actually I've just remembered when I told when I did this I've done this wrong I actually I should have told it to connect to the clock to this UI clock and not to the UI clock additional clock so I'll just quickly connect that so you can just if you don't know how to do that you can just re click on a pin reconnect it and do disconnect uh, and then then connect it up so we have this all through we have the microblaze is connected in and everything um, and we're beginning to get the basics of a uh, of a system ready to uh, ready to go now what I want to do then is I'm going to run this connection automation uh, and this connection automation, I'm going to ask it to connect in the AXI of the, A, the MIG to the AXI to the AXI network. So I click OK. And it's going to run around and it's going to put us in a AXI. It's going to put us in a smart interconnect module here, you can see. Uh, and it's connected this now into the, uh, the, the DDR memory such that we can go from the microblaze through this smart interconnect and then into um, into the into the DDR into the DDR memory uh, if we if we want to. And this is really this gives us the ability to use that. We can if we wanted to in this application you can't because I've not turned on the uh, instruction path. But if you want to, we can run we can then store data in the in the memory uh, in the MIG. And if we turn on the instruction path, we can grab data from there. As, we can grab data from there as well. And it makes it really uh, really nice and really nice and simple. Now the next thing, so we've got the basics of our of our system uh, of our system now. Uh, what we need to do is we need to just get this connected through a little bit more, and we need to bring in a few additional things. So what we're going to do is we need to give it the external uh, the external reset, uh, and what to do that we're going to grab the reset here. And we're going to drag it across onto here, and you see how it's already going to go across and pull across onto uh, onto this system here. So we see that that's pulled through, and we've got the reset uh, the reset enabled as well. What we need to do, however, is if you look at this, so I'll just unselect this for a moment. This, if I zoom in, this is expecting the the memory interface diagram. Uh, the memory inter the memory interface here is expecting a active load reset. And uh, let me just pop this in for a second again to show you something. Because if I click on the reset here and I right click on it and I look at the external port properties, then I can see that on the board, the board knows that it's active. Uh, the board knows that it's active high, uh, which is going to cause us a problem because active high, active low, they're going to be at the wrong thing. The mix is going to be constantly reset. Nothing's ever gonna, nothing's ever gonna work. So what we'll do is we'll just double click on the memory interface generator here. Um, and we'll start and we'll, and we'll make a quick modification to that memory interface generator. So we'll click on next. We just want to, we don't want to change anything until we see the relevant, uh, until we see the relevant point in the, in the design. Uh, so we'll click on next, uh, our next, uh, you can see here we're clocking the DDR at 400 uh, at 400 megahertz. Uh, it's on the next one. We have a we have a data relationship here. Click on the next one. It's on the next tab. So here we can see that we've got a uh, an active a system reset polarity of active low. Uh, we need to change that to be active high. Uh, in this in this example, uh, and we will click on 
we will click on next. Now we have to regenerate this because we've made some changes to it. So we'll leave the pinout exactly the same. The pinout should be valid, uh, which it is. We can click OK. We click on next. We click on next. We click on next. We accept this. Click on next. Um, next, we should be able to generate. We should be able to generate it. And while that generates, I'll try and take a quick look through some questions uh, in the um, in the in the answer. Uh, somebody was asking if there's any power constraints related to active high or active low. Uh, and no, there's not really any power constraints to related to whether the reset is active high or active low. It's just really making sure that we've got a standard approach through our uh, through our system and making and making sure that the uh, the solution is, is is one that's actually going to work and that when we go through there, we're not going to end up with the microblaze being in. Um, in reset uh, and never coming out of reset because the the MIGS in reset which holds everything else downstream in in, re in reset. Uh, so somebody wants you to say well, how can I see the active low part? So if you select on the pin here you can see that the polarity is active high and prior to me making that change you could see the the, 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 the input pin had this inversion circle on it which shows that it's an active low, an active low reset, uh, and therefore we needed to change it to make it an active, an active high reset, uh, and pull through in that in that direction. Um, so, with regards to the to the to the cache uh, and the microblaze configuration in the real time one, uh, that really depends upon your. It really depends entirely upon your application. And what and what you need to and how you're going to run it and, and do it. The if you're running from DDR memory, then you want to have the caches in local memory connected close to the close to the microblaze to give you the best performance possible. If you're just running from my if you're just running from um, BRAM memory anyway, then having the cache is a little bit uh, is is a little bit. Um, what's the word for it? In, in, in unnecessary because you've got the same you've got the same path anyway. Uh, so that that's good. So we're here now. We've got a basic system that's coming together. We have the microblaze up and running. We have the memory interface generator connected. We have our AXI interface uh, connect. We have our AXI interface connected. We've got the debug module. Well, we've got the reset module. We've got our local. We've got our local uh, RAMs. But what I want to do is I want to show you just a simple example of how you can how you can create and control the microblaze, how you can use the, the microblaze to create and control real world real world signals. Uh, so we're going to add in a timer, and the one we're going to add in is the AXI is the AXI timer, uh, and we're going to double click on that, and you'll see this puts us a new block in up the top, puts us a new block in up the top here. Uh, and if you want to double click on it, let's just double click and take a look at it. You know, it, there are there are two time there are two timers in there, uh, both 32 bit at the moment. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna change I'm not gonna change those. Uh, everything the input signals the output signals are active high. Uh, you'll see on the output the, the one that the thing that really interests me uh, in this instance is the PWM zero signal. So that's what's going to be that's what we're going to use. Uh, in our example, but first off, we need to connect it into the system. Uh, now we could do it by hand. I'm going to pop this out to do this bit now. Just make it a little bit bigger uh, and go for there. Now, now we could pop it. We could just sort of but manually. We could do this. We could change the number of number of ports on the smart AXI connect. We could map all this through. Oh, again, we could hit this run AXI connection, uh, and we'll let it run. We'll pick up the uh, the smart AXI connect there. And let it run through. So if we do this, uh, and then I'm just going to redraw the regenerate the layout so as it looks a little bit a little bit nicer. Uh, and you can see now connected to our smart AXI interconnect, uh, we have uh, two uh, we have two peripherals, the, the MIG and the timer. Uh, we can do the next thing we need to do is we need to sort the pin out and make the pin and make the make a pin. Such that we can the output from the timer, such that we can control the LED on the on the board. So if we right click on the PWM zero, uh, we can scroll down here and we can click on Make External. 
And that will give us an external signal called PWM PWM0. And if we want to make any changes to if you want to make any changes to that, uh, we can we can click on it and we can go to the uh, we can go to the signal there. I'm just going to take the name off uh, such that it has a more sensible uh, more sensible name than PWM. Uh, ah, so Richard was just asking another question, and this is interesting, and this is because, so the automation, it wants to add a reset pin here, uh, actually because I've not, um, if I go to the reset block here, this reset block here actually doesn't have an external reset connected. Uh, so if you, so in this case, if you want to make sure that you've got an external reset, if you don't have an external reset connected, if we just connect this to the reset here, uh, then it should go. Uh, it should go away. Uh, it should be automatic. Um, it should automatically detect the reset level. The reset level. So when we validate the design later on, that 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 inversion circle should uh, should disappear. I think, uh, and we should be okay. But yeah, if you try and run it through, it will pop through a second um, a second. Um, a second IP code. So the reason we need, why do we need the timer in the in the block diagram? So we're going to use the timer to generate a pulse width modulated output that's going to drive an LED on the uh, on the board, and we're going to be able to control that LED, the brightness of that LED, over a simple over a simple UART link, uh, just to show that that's that's all up and working uh, and is running nicely. So I'm just going to pop this back in for a minute because the next thing I want to do is uh, now we've added this. Uh, we've got our we've got our timer in there. We've got our MIG in there. Uh, what I want to add in now is I want to add in the UART such that we can communicate with it. So I'm going to drop the UART in there. Um, we can we can see that uh, on, we can see that on there. Uh, we can see the we can see the UART's being dropped in again. The connection automations come up. Uh, so I'm going to pick and collect that connection automation, and now we can see that we've got three elements connected to our our UR, uh, and all these are connected onto the onto the board. Uh, if we double click on the UR, uh, we can see that in the IP we can we can change the board rate if we want to, uh, all the way up to uh, 200. 30,400 board rate. I'm going to leave it at 9600. We're not going to try and do anything. Uh, anything rapid or, or or quick with that, uh, and parity. Well, we're not really doing the safety critical application, so I'm going to leave it uh, leave it with no no parity. Uh, and that connects us through onto our uh, onto our block design, and we've run the uh, we've run the auto, we've run the automation. So now we've got everything we need in our design to begin. To create the solution and, and create something that's actually going to actually going to work. So what we're going to do now is I want to make sure that I've got no errors in the design. Um, talking and doing this live might have led me to put some in. So uh, especially, so I'm going to click on the validate design. Um, and well, this is what we want to see. We want to see that there's no errors or no errors or critical warnings in the in the design. And when we come to it, once we've got that, we can also see. If we want to see uh, the addresses, we can look at the address map. Uh, so, Paul, I'm going to come to that in a minute as to how we connect the pin to the to the board on the LED. So, at the moment, it's just sort of it's not allocated because the board's not aware of it. It's not allocated. All the other ones, because they become from the board tab, they are allocated to I. The board does know where they are allocated to I/O, but it doesn't know for that LED pin. So, I'm going to show you that. If you can just bear with me a second, I'll show you that in a second. And we can see here the, the memory addresses of where of where everything is. And if you want to see a nice address map, we can see we can see that we can see that visually. Uh, we can see that visually here. Once we've got this, what we've got now is we have a block diagram. Uh, but that block diagram needs to be uh, needs to be generated and, and run through into synthesis, place and route. And to do that, actually, the first thing we need to do is we need to create a wrapper file. For our uh, block diagram that we've just created, uh, so if we right-click, we can right-click on here and we can click Create HDL Wrapper. 
Uh, and it's going to give us this option to create the HDL wrapper as to whether we want to manage it or whether we want to let Vibardo manage it. What we're going to do is we're going to let Vibardo manage it. Uh, so we're going to click OK. And that letting Vibardo manage it means that any changes we make to the design uh, is going to run through and come from, is going to be reflected automatically in that VHDL netlist or that very log netlist. Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to do anything. Uh, we don't have to do anything with it. So just a couple of things while we're, while while this is going, I'll try and answer a few questions. Uh, so somebody was asking later on. Yes, you can drag. You can grab this webinar if you go back. It will all be. It will all be available. Uh, if you want to understand the memory map of the system, like we were just saying, you can see here on the on the address editor where all the where all the memory. Uh, where all the memory resides. So we can see the local memory address is starts at the base master address of zero, and it's the 32 kilobytes that we allocated uh, for it to uh, for it to for it to for it to uh, for it to run from its applications. In. Um, we can run. Somebody was saying like the, the running in the local memory versus running in the memory interface generator. And that really always comes down to the size of your application. I'm always a big fan that if you can get away with implementing the, the microblaze design in the block RAM, then you should, because all you have to do then is merge the bit file, merge the application that you create in Vita, so the L file. You can merge that with the Vivado design using, using Vivado. Uh, and that will create your bit file that contains the application software as well. So that when your application is programmed, it will just start. It will just start running. Uh, in fact, while we just, I'll come back to talk about that in a second. While we do that, I'm just going to start uh, start the next stage of this. I'm just going to run the synthesis. I'm not. I'm not going to run the place and root. I'm going to do the. For those of you in the UK, I'm going to do the best traditions of Blue Peter and use a, an XSA that I created earlier on. Uh, to save us some, to save us all sitting and watching the, the, the design being uh, synthesized and implemented. But coming back to that microblaze versus MIG, if the application will, sorry, me block memory versus MIG, if the application will fit in the block memory, then it's a really good, a really good thing to do that because you can, like I say, you can merge it with in Vivado. You program the bitstream in your application software just springs to life and starts running. If you do it via, if you if it's too big and it needs to go into DDR, then what happens is you need to take your L file, you need to convert your L file into a S record file, you need to store that S record file uh, somewhere within your, um, you need to store that S record file somewhere within the uh, non-volatile memory. Then you need to create a first stage bootloader, which Vitus will give you that gets merged with the bit file in, in, in the microblaze, such that when the microblaze starts up, it can go away, it can access the S records in the, um, in the non-volatile memory, and it can cross load the application then into DDR memory, such that the, such that the system can start running. And that makes, a, it makes it a very flexible solution. And obviously if you're using Linux or something like that, then that's how you do it. Uh, but if you're if you're doing a small application, then it does add it does add quite a uh, quite an quite an overhead. So let's take a look at while this just runs through, and hopefully it runs through quickly. I'll give it a minute or two. If it doesn't, I'll open up the other design that's already uh, pre -con pre configured. Well, we're going to put that we've not done any constraints in any constraints in the XDC yet, um, and I'm gonna and, I, and we're going to put those in in a minute. The reason. The reason why that I'm just only running the synthesis and not the place in route in the bitstream generation is I want to show you a nice way. If you're not, if you're not familiar with creating uh, XDC constraints, I wanted to show you a nice way to, to be able to do to be able to do that. And hopefully it shouldn't it shouldn't take too long to uh, run through uh, and and do as it runs through the out of context uh, out of context module out of context modules. So we'll take a look through and try and answer a few more questions. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we'll be adding some. We'll be adding some constraints in a in a minute. Um, so how to do version control in Git is quite interesting in um, in Vitus that it, it does allow you to integrate with it quite easily. 
uh, to, to integrate within, within Git and to be able to push and pull from repositories. And it will also show you when data has, well, that wasn't expected. Uh, it will also show you when, uh, when, when it has actually, um, when it has actually uh, gone, gone through it. So you just have to bear with me a second because Vivado, uh, Vivado crash, I'll just restart it. Uh, and then we'll uh, then we'll then we'll take it from uh, we'll take it from we'll take it from there. Where did that go? Jam on Mr. Rivada. Uh But yeah, so we'll 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 show you how to create all those uh, all those constraints and everything as well. Where's that gone? Ah, here it comes finally. I'm probably likely to get two. I'm probably likely to get two versions uh, open, opened, uh, open now. Uh, while it does it, what I will do once it's open, though, actually, is we will flick over um, to the to the one that's actually to the one that's pre-existing and built. Yep. While this is getting up, Adam, where can uh, the attendees find the GitHub repo? So yeah, so I did put that right at the top of the chat, but it's probably dropped out. Uh, okay, so I'll get that. it. No, 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 I've got it here. I've got it here. So let me put that there. Uh, so awesome. there, there, there we go. So there's the GitHub repo uh, for everybody that wants to, uh, everybody that wants to do this. And we'll give it a second or two for it to open. Obviously it's, um, um, Obviously, it takes a little while to open. So this one's the one that we're going to take a look at now. We're going to open the we're going to open the synthesized design. It's exactly the same as the one uh, the one be the one before was. Uh, it's just uh, this one's implemented. Obviously, it doesn't. My machine doesn't like streaming uh, and building uh, and building at the same time. So what else are the questions do we have while this opens? Uh, yeah, so Peter, there is a uh, there is an example here uh, which shows it all step by which shows it all step by step. Uh, once this is open, the synthesized design, we can open, we can create the constraints, and we can run this through. Uh, I wanted to show this. I wanted to show you the way of using the using the uh, the, the synthesized view, uh, just to make it nice and just to make it nice and easy for everybody. But any questions? Keep please keep throwing them. Uh, please keep throwing them out, uh, and we'll take it. Um, we'll, we'll we'll try and answer them. Uh, and apologies if I miss one. There's I've never seen quite so many. I've never seen quite so many questions. Uh, yeah, that's exciting. <laughs> flowing flowing through this. It's kind of like I'll, I'll answer that, and then it's kind of gone. So we were talking just to come back on track a little bit. We were talking about how we wanted to assign the uh, assign the thing. Um, and what and, and in this in this in this view here, the synthesized view, you can see obviously the the board is aware of all the ones that the tools are aware of all the things such as the DDR3, the RS232, the reset, even the clocks. But for the scalar port, it wouldn't be. So for the scalar port here, we have to select down. And if you are using a uh, a Spartan and SP701 board, then this is the pin you need to allocate to. You need to allocate j25 uh to that to that pin um and then you need to change the io standard to lv to lvds lvc mos uh so just to quickly come back on something so paul you mentioned about the xsa file is in the github repo the xsa file is the hardware definition uh, for the project so it will allow you if you've got vitus to import it into vitus and, and flow through it it's the solution for the sp701 what I will do at the end of this is I will upload a tickle script that will allow you to recreate the entirety of the Vivado project uh, from, uh, from it. So just make sure that you've got this on the appropriate pins, the appropriate IO standard for your, for your board, and then click on save. Now, when you do that, it'll ask you to save, a, uh, save the XDC file and you just give it a name of uh, whatever name you would like it. Uh, and that will come and that will come through. So in this example, 
uh, I called mine io.xdc. Um, and when this opens in a second, we should see uh, we should you should see the pins and everything that's in there. Ah, two versions of the bar are open. Uh, we should see the pins and everything in there. So this is a great question. So but why couldn't I drag the LEDs from the from the board resources onto the IPI canvas? And if I did that, and, and you can, don't don't get me wrong, you can. You can grab it and drag it. But if I did that, it would pull that across as though I just wanted to turn the LEDs on or off. So it would add a general purpose AXI module to it, uh, an, a, an AXI, an AXI pin to it. Um, and then uh, we would have to replace it. So in this case, I've just added the uh, added the AXI timer. Uh, Brett, the answer for why I'm doing this in 2021.1 uh, uh, is purely because um, I've got seven different versions, I think, of Bravado on my machine at this point in time to support different custom projects. And I couldn't quite fit on uh, the latest version of, uh, of Bravado, uh, but it shouldn't be any, it shouldn't be any different from, uh, from one to the, uh, from one to the other. Uh, so I'm just going to cancel that. See why it's taking taking so long. So once we've got this, we've got our design. We've got our design created and our uh, design ready to go. So if you're starting with the MCS, that's that's a problem because the MCS doesn't allow you to connect to um, the MCS doesn't allow you connect to connect to uh, AXI peripherals and such like like we have in this example. Uh, so you'll have to you'll have to make a slot. You'll have to uh, perhaps think about using some of the GPIO to connect to it. So I'm going to close this. This is going to close my. I don't want to save any changes because I don't want to go out of uh, out of state. Uh, and once you've run through, and I'm not going to do this now. Once you've selected those IO, uh, selected those constraints, and you've run through it, you can click on this generate bitstream button here, and it'll run through. And after about 10 or 20 minutes, you'll you'll see this up the top, the right. The right bit stream, the right bit stream conflict. Once we've uh, once we've got the uh, right bit stream, uh, once we've got the right bit stream completed, we're nearly finished with Vivado. So we can go over here. We can we need to export the hardware such that we can use it in uh, in Vitus. Uh, once we get there, we can click on the next. We're going to tell it that we want to include the bitstream and we want to include uh, include everything in there. Uh, so then I'm going to click on next here. Uh, I'm going to leave everything unchanged. It's going to drop it. It's going to drop out the XSA where I want to uh, drop that XSA. Uh, and I'm going to click on next. It's going to tell me because I've got an, a, a module that exists. I've already done this in this project. Uh, so I'm going to click on yes. In your project, it shouldn't. And then I'm going to click on finish. So, Kumar, yes, obviously, it's like anything. This is a this is logic that you're implementing, and you've got other things in your design. Now, I didn't really put any constraints, here, timing constraints, here on this because it's literally the only thing in the design. Uh, therefore, the chances of it not running at 100 100 mega are fairly fairly slim. If you if you want if you want to push it or you've got more things in the more things in the design, this is running maybe what 17 percent of the 17 percent of the device. Uh, then you would need to add constraints, and you can do those constraints uh, from the synthesis view. You can add in and walk through and add in clock constraints and such like also. So now you've got this exported. What we're going to do is I'm going to go to Tools and I'm going to go to Launch Vitus IDE. And it's going to think a little while. Of course, it's going to think a long while today. And when the Vitus IDE is going to come up, it's going to ask us for where we want to store the work, where we want to store our, our workspace that we want to use. Now, this is the workspace that all the files are going to be saved in, and this is this one is the one I've done for pre, I pre-did uh, for the 
uh, for the exact for the example. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on browse here, and I'm just going to change this to be ever so slightly different to an ever so slightly different directory under here. Uh, this is my project. Uh, I'm going to create a new folder here, and I'm going to call it Workspace Live, just so as we get the full journey of it. Uh, and once we've done that, I'm going to select that folder, uh, and I'm going to launch Vitus. So, Felix, this is a really interesting. This is a really interesting question, um, and I'm just going to open my block diagram just to answer that. Just to answer that question, actually, Felix, about Felix asking. So, so far, everything in my design, everything's running at the processing speed of the of the of the microblaze. And what happens if we've got IP that are running at different different clock frequencies? So, say for example. What happens if this was not running from the same clock that's running on the microblaze, but was running on a faster, uh, a faster or a different clock? Well, that's really quite simple because what we can do in the in the smart interconnect is we can double click on the smart interconnect and we can change the number of clock inputs that are that are coming in, maybe two, three, uh, two, three, four, whatever we whatever we want. We can connect the clock. We can connect the clock. Uh, we can connect the clock that we're using to that. Uh, and then to the IP peripheral. Uh, and actually what happens is the smart interconnect will is clever enough to work out and associate uh, associate what interface we, is re related with what clock. And then it will handle all of the clock domain. It will handle all of the clock domain crossing for you. So you shouldn't you shouldn't need to implement any any BIFOs or anything like or anything like that in the design. So once we've got uh, once we've got Bravado exported, once we've got our XSA from Bravado exported, we, we've created a new workspace and we've got to we've got to bite us. The next thing we're going to do then is we're going to create an application. We're going to create an application project and start working uh, and start working with our board that we've got targeted. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to click on this one, which is create application project. Uh, you always get this kind of welcome screen. Uh, and I'm going to skip over that. And then we need to find, we have this concept in Vitus of a platform. And what that means is we need to have the, the, a defined hardware platform from, uh, from Vivado or what we've downloaded from somewhere else. Say so if we've got an acceleration platform. So we're going to click on create new hardware platform. Uh, and you'll see there are some built in ones already. So if you've got a versal board or a 706 or 102 or 106 or a Z board, then we can use their default default project. If not, then we can excuse me, we can browse to where we've just exported our one. Uh, and we know that ours is under here, mastering microblaze. And we know it's this one. We 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 exported this file uh, a few a few minutes ago at quarter past five in the UK, 12 minutes past five in the UK time. So once we've got that, we can click on next. We can give it a project name. So I'm going to call this application because I'm very imaginative in how I name my uh, name my projects. You'll see it's going to give us a system project name as well. Uh, and if we click on next, uh, now if we're doing things um, with that, Felix, yes, you can. You can put elements of the project into into platform controllers into um, into Git as well, although you'll need to be careful as to what you put in or not, because it's going to generate you all the BSP and everything as part of that, and you don't really need that. You just need the key settings file, so your your Git ignore file will get some uh, will get some good use. Um, I can find you one afterwards, Felix, and send you one uh, on that that shows that shows how to do it. Uh, so what we've got is the uh, is the domains, uh, and if that's true, so. In all these slides, there's my email address. So if you've asked a question, I've not answered it, and you want some clarification, or or if I forget, and I apologise if I if I forget to answer one of your questions or send you something off, just send me an email and say, hey Adam, uh, where where is this, and we'll we'll sort it out. Um, so we've got this. We're going to set the domain up. We don't make any changes to this. It's not like we're working with a complex Linux system in this solution, like we would be on an MPSOC. Uh, and we're going to select the hello world example here. Now, I'm always a big believer 
of this hello world example, particularly with microblazers, because what we want to see is that we've not got anything wrong in our hardware design and that it's going to actually give us something that we can give us something that we can see um, and, and prove that we can prove that we can get it working. So what you'll um, what you will see is you'll see two elements you'll see our application and you'll see our our, our platform here which is named after the uh, named after the the design the design mapper the important things to see to, to know here are the applicate this application tab here and if we if we see this option here navigate to the board, board support settings then we will see these are all the settings for the BSP, the BSP file being set. So we, if we wanted to modify the BSP file, if we wanted to include any libraries or anything, like the lightweight IP or the, or the secure thing, if we wanted to change any of the drivers that were, if, sorry, if we wanted to change any of the drivers that were being used, if we wanted to change any of the default options or compiler configurations, or if we wanted to change, for example, if we've got multiple UARTs, we wanted to change the stand in and stand it out, uh, then we can do that. As it is, we're not going to change. We're not going to change anything in this. I'm just showing you this for uh, for reference. However, uh, we'll come to it in a minute. We'll come back to this. I believe these are very important or, or very interesting if you're new to it. The the uh, the examples the examples application. But for the time being, we're just going to prove that mine's not broken uh, while we've been doing this. So uh, we've got the application system under the sources here you'll see we have a file called hello world.c and in that hello world.c we have the simplest uh, bit of code that's ever been uh, that's ever been written what we want to do is we want to build our system now we want to make sure that we've got this debug tab set so if you click the uh, down arrow on here it should be set for debug so that's going to include all the debug information in the application when it's built it gives us a slightly larger application but it means we can single step through it and we can uh, we can work through it uh, so once we've got that, I'm going to click on the hammer here to build it. Uh, and unlike uh, unlike Bravado, it's going to take a few seconds to it's going to take a few seconds to build through. Um, and we can see there that it's uh, it's all gone through and built our uh, and built our applica built our application. Uh, we can see it's relatively small size. You know, it's only five thousand five thousand bytes. Uh, so it fits nicely in our um, in, a, in our in our memory. So where we control where this sits is we use the linker file, the linker script here, uh, and we can change the uh, we can change elements of this to be in either the uh, the local uh, the local local memories like we've got it, or in the in the DDR. In this example, I'm just going to run it from the uh, from the local from the local memory uh, once we get that i'm going i'm not going to make any changes to that well i'm not going to save any changes to that so we've now got an application that's built and we just want to see that it's going to say hello we just want to see that it's going to say hello will so we're going to come down here to the uh, to the application we're going to select this debug here and we're going to right click on it and on from debug we're going to select launch hardware single application debug and what I hope we will see is down here in the bottom, you'll see it's launching the, the, the debugger application. You'll see it's about to program the uh, about to program the FPGA. And once it's programmed the FPGA, it's going to use that microblaze debug module to download the application into this into the processor. And just as we'd like, it's going to stop here. The application here is going to stop at the at, uh, at the entry point. Uh, and once it's stopped at the entry point, we can then control the flow of the program. So I'm just going to I'm just going to minimize this for a second. In fact, actually, I will push the, put this in the middle of my screen here, uh, and I have a, a terminal that's open, uh, and I'm going to just clear that clear that terminal. Uh, so this has already stopped at the application side, and if I want to single step through then we can single step through and you'll see that it prints out hello world. Now this is a nice pipe cleaning exercise. So the fact that you can download the application to your microblaze lets you know that you've actually got a microblaze in your hardware. 
that can be found that's not in reset that has a clock and that is that is that is uh, fairly functional the fact that we can see the hello world just kind of wraps it up and tells us that we can download applications we can run applications on it and we can see uh, we can see what we want to do we can see everything that we want to in there so once we've got once we've got this running we're now in a position that we can start thinking about running through our application and creating a little bit more a little bit of a more complex application uh, that's going to toggle and drive our L, drive our led now i'm not going to sit here and type it in um, line by line for everybody uh, in this instance the solution is on if you've got a connection to the mac if you can remember uh where the uh curtis i'll come back to that in a second uh if you can remember where the github repo is then there is a uh, a c source file in the github repo um and you can see you can see that uh, you can see the single you can see the source code on the c source code underneath that now the c source code for this is um the c source code for this is nicely it's all based off an example so xilinx are really nice in that they provide a lot of examples and they hold your hand and, and help you to get um help you to get help you to get help you to get ready to, to to get the best out of your design so if for example you've used the axi timer you've never used it before you don't know how to use it you can click on the documentation here or you can click on this import examples and if you see it then opens a number of example applications that you can use within your uh, within your system so for example if you want to see excuse me if you want to see how the pwm works you can input you can select this um, you can select it and import it into your design or you can open the open the examples directory which is what i normally tend to do uh, and then where's my examples directory gone and then you can open the uh, you can open the you can open it in an editor and take a look through it and, and see how they're they're using it to flow through uh, and get their design get their design working. Now mine's a much my, the, the application that we've got in today is a much simpler, much smaller, much easier cut down uh, cut down solution than this. So what we're going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to click A and I'm going to delete everything in here uh, and then I'm going to click going to go across to my github repo and i'm going to just copy and paste the code uh from that's in my uh github get this in my github repo um so yeah so i mean somebody naveen was asking about how you can load the elf in the body and if you want to debug your, if you want to create your application and debug your application, then you need to use a var, to use the Vitus. So Vitus is going to help you create. Vitus is going to compile you. Is going to compile you the Elf and create the Elf. It's going to allow you to download and debug the uh, and debug the application uh, as well. Uh, and we'll take a little bit more about debugging in a minute. But but uh, Enrique is quite correct. Once you've got your application ready you can come into Vivado and you can do associate elf you can do associate elf files uh, and then you can select this loop here uh, where it's at the moment it's just looking for the local the boot loop uh, you can select this here you can add a file and i'll show you how to do this i'm not going to regenerate the bit stream because it'll take uh, it'll just take too long uh, but we can come in here we can go to the microblaze we can go to the uh, to the workspace and under application and debug there'll be an application.elf you can click ok you can click ok there uh, and then that did i select that or not uh, i just think it i think uh, but you should be able to change that and then when you click on ok there you'll see the right bitstream go out of go out of date and if you just run the bitstream element again it'll just it won't run through the entire implementation uh, but it'll run through the bit it'll run through the bit stream um, and and drop this uh, and drop that in there for you so that should be uh, that should be quite nice so once we've done this we we, we have our application now uh and copy and paste in and, and, and if you've not used this before if you're not too familiar with it before i'm just going to change the view back to the um, back to the other view 
Uh, and what we're going to do is, because we've now got a new software file, so there's a few things that we've added in there that you might not be too familiar with. So we have this file called xparameters.h, and if we open that declaration, we can see this defines all of the configurations of our uh, of our microbase system. It's the same for Zinc, Zinc MPSOCs and such like. Uh, it contains all of these configurations. So you can see there's a lot of information about the about the D, about the microbase. Uh, but down the bottom, we'll see about the VRAM controllers, uh, and more interestingly, we'll begin to see them about the time about the timers. So we see the information about the timer. You see that base address. Um, hold up a bit. You see that you see the base address and the high address that that flows through from the border. And you see the d device ID number, and you see the same. For, you see the same for the, the. You see the same for the UR. And this xparameters.h file allows us to work with the APIs that Xilinx provide in their drivers, such as the. Uh, in this example, the 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 the, the timer controller. Uh, you'll see that it gives us a range of functions that allow us to initialize initialize the timer uh, to start and stop the timer to get to, to get values to set up the p to set up the pwm to set the to set the timer options and such like and all of these are passed to it using some of the information from that uh, from that x parameter file for example uh, we give it the, uh, the this timer id uh, for the timer we give it this timer id which is using this de using this uh, definition which is defined within the X parameters.h file. So as when it comes through, it knows that to configure the timer for, for this address and this and this settings. Hopefully that makes uh, that makes sense to, to everybody. So what we do in our what we do in our, in our application, we're we're ma making a few definitions up front. We're setting a definition for the PWM period. We've set the timer IDs. Uh, not actually using this and not actually using these two at the moment, actually. Uh, I used this initially, the divider counter initially when I was testing it, but uh, it's uh, it's coming up. And then we're using uh, we're using this type of device timer ID. So what we've done here is we've then defined a few a few examples, a few a few, examples, a few variables that we're going to use, a few 8-bit variables, some 32 bit variables, and a floating bit variable. Uh, we're going to initialize the platform and just just print out a message that says, hey, this is um, this is what, where we're running it from. We're then going to initialize a timer using that information in the um, in the x parameters dot h. Once we've done that, we're going to call this function called disable pwm, which is defined within the API for the for the timer. And once we've done that, we're going to work out what we want to what we want to do. So we're going to take the uh, we're going to take the a few things. So we're going to take our pwm period. And we're going to calculate. We're going to calculate an initial an initial period uh, for the PWM at one at one tenth. We're going to configure the PWM. We're going to give it the the instance of the uh, instance of the timer. We're going to give it the period that we want and the duration that we want that to be on. And Robert, yes, it is it is recording. Uh, so we're going to give it the duration that we want it to be on, and then that's going to give us the that's going to give us the duty. That's going to give us the duty cycle that we're that we're running at. Uh, we don't actually use this duty cycle anyway. It's just in case I wanted to print it out to the screen to show what's show what's going on. Once we've configured this to give it the duty cycle that we want, we're just going to enable the PWM, and then it's just going to free run, putting out that as a PWM all the putting out that at the PWM width all the time. And that's nice and simple for a simple example, but. As you know, as engineers, we like we like to control things and show things as show things are working. Uh, so what we're going to do actually is we're going to put this into a loop, and we're going to ask it to select the brightness. Actually, to select the brightness between zero and nine. We're going to read a value in then over the UART terminal. Uh, we're going to convert that value from a um, from an ASCII value to a to a real value. Uh, we're going to create it. We're going to scale that into a floating a floating point number, and then we're just going to use that to define how much of the PWM period that we're on. So we're going to go from 100% on to 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. <laughs> once we've got, once we've worked out the the high time that we the, the period doesn't change. Once we've worked out the high time, then we're going to disable the PWM. We're going to update the PWM 
settings for the new period and the new high time, and then we're going to enable the PWM. And it's just going to run for forever and a day. Now, I'm just going to turn, I've got my background on blurred, which is probably going to blur the board out. So I'm going to just try and turn that off. A second, so there we go. So I can, you can see me, uh, you can see me now without the um, without the element, um, and then we have it. So what I'm going to do now is first things first. I'm going to click build. Okay, that's okay. 140 milliseconds to build. Remind sir, we need to make bravado build in that sort of time period. Um, and then I'm going to click on. I'm going to I'm going to run this on the hardware and click debug. Uh, I've already got a session started from when we did the Hello World, so I'm just going to click OK. Uh, and hopefully this should download. If not, then we'll have to just, no, I knew it was going to do that. I have to just do it again. Uh, this time it's going to, it's downloaded the FPJ, it's downloaded the application. I'm going to minimize this again. I'm going to put my terminal window up here. Uh, and then once we've got this, we should see it. So I've got. Hopefully you can hopefully you can see this. The most unscientific, um, unscientific to do that. You can you can use the Paul. You can use the the Vita serial terminal to to do this. So you can see we have a number of LEDs along here, all of which are currently all of which are currently off. Uh, and if I start running the application, so I'm going to hit resume the application here. I'm not going to breakpoint it this time. Uh, I'm just going to run. I'm just going to run through this. You'll see it comes up. It gives us the mastery microblaze. Please select a brightness between zero and one. I'm going to hold this up a little bit more. Uh, and on my keyboard, I'm going to press one. And what you should see if I hold it in is you should see this LED has come on. But it's very, uh, very, very dim because it's only getting ten percent of the uh, ten percent of the waveform. If I put it at two percent, twenty percent, thirty percent, forty percent, fifty percent, you'll see it begins to get much brighter. Doesn't work so well. Doesn't work so well looking at it, unfortunately, on the uh, on the screen. Uh, but it is. But that's how it's uh, that's how it's working. So it's, as we change that uh, as we change that brightness. Then we can then we see the LED uh, intensity increase or decrease because we're changing the pulse width modulation uh, that's that's going into it. And because we've set the period such that human eyes aren't so great, uh, if we, because we've set the period such that you can't actually see the uh, the period of the PWM such that you can't actually see the flickering of the LED. If you change the period to quite a long time, uh, if you experiment with it, then you can see the uh, then you can see it exactly. You can see the LED actually flickering. Uh, but because we've set this to a to a reasonably uh, fast fast period of time, the human eye can't see it. It just interprets it as being slightly uh, slightly. Dip. We we just see that as being slightly dimmer uh, than it was was bef was before. So if anybody what if anybody's running this and you've got problems, so just sort of begin to wrap up now. If we get any issues, say I've got something wrong, what we can do is we can break point this. So we can stick a let's put a break point in. Uh, just after the, uh, just after the the invite, for example. Uh, so if I then tell it I want it to be five, uh, what we see here is the application stops uh, because we've been running because we've been running through. Uh, we've hit the condition for the breakpoint, uh, so we can see what's going up. We can see up top we've got the variables because these are local variables. We can see that we can see the values of these. Uh, we can see that we've just got five. Added in as the added in as the value. If we hold our mouse over any of it, our cursor over any of it, we can see the value. We can see all the different uh, different values that it is in the in the hex, in decimal, in in opt. Uh, obviously, we've just got an ASCII character. We don't really want to uh, use the ASCII character, uh, so we can single step by using this step over function here, uh, and we can step over it, and we can see now that we've converted it from an ASCII character to a to an actual number, uh, which is which is five. Um, uh, so yeah, you can you can see the source code off the top of my head. 
Felix, I can't remember how to do that. You, you, but you can you can see the you can see the instructions. Um, and I can't remember how to do that, I'm afraid. Uh, but I will um, I will I will find a way. If you message me, I'll 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 show you. Uh, so come out, yeah, you can do this in SDK as well. It's just these labs are set up to just show you the Vitus flow, SDK flow is slightly, slightly different. But as you step through here, we can step through it and we can see uh, we can see what's we can see what's going on. Now, if we get to a point and we've got a function that we're not sure what's going on, then actually what we can do is we can step into it as well. So we can step into that, we can step into the function, and then we can single step, we can single step over it and step through. Uh, and step through and see what's uh, see what's going on, and then we can uh, we can step out of it and and run through, and then resume that, and our application keeps uh, running through. Uh, so can you breakpoint the value on line fifty three? So this value here, yeah. Let's let's just do that again for you, Paul. So if I come in here and I put in so six as an example, it stops. I can come in here and I can change that to seven. And you can see that uh, you can see that that line is being changed to, uh, to to seven. So you can you can manually force that and you can look at memories as well. So if you wanted to look at the memory, see if I can remember the DRAM memory address, which is A123, 1212. You can see the uh, you can see the memory you can see the memory address you can see the VRAM address as well. The single step button are these buttons on the top, Curtis. So these these three buttons here: the step into, the step over, and the step uh, and the step return. Uh, Felix, I'm not I, I'm not aware of any. I don't know if uh, I don't know if the mice does, uh, but but that's um, that's about. Um, I've always used a sort of the Vitus approach for, for, for debugging uh, for debugging this. So that really that really brings us um, up to the uh, up to here. This is unused mem This is unused memory space. This is if you remember back uh, to the uh, if you remember back to the memory space. This seven uh, addresses at this range aren't, aren't supported. Hence why it's just reporting out uh, decode. So it's only addresses from. 8,000 uh, that is. Um, the block diagram. So, Mustafa, we talked about uh, the block. We talked about the block diagram, how we connected that. And it's in the, if you go to the instructions online that you can see at the GitHub, it steps you through that. But we did that in Vivado. Um, we did that in Vivado by opening the, um, by opening the, um the synthesized view and then picking the i the underside i open but it's all in the it's all in the instructions uh the webinar gustavo you just go back to you just go back to livestorm uh yeah so if you just go back to livestorm the the, the link that you've got then it will be available live so and what i'll do is i'll put so if you give me a day or two i will put some um I'll put some links on my website so that you can come back so that you can find everything from you can find the recording you can find the um you can you can find all the github and everything so if you go back to my website uh in fact i will pull that up just as you all know where it is but if you go to my website here and you go to the workshops uh then i'll put a i'll put a tab up for the workshops such such that you can see um such that you can see this and get and get through to it so this is the end of my this is the end of the lab really if there's any other questions anybody's got uh please uh please let me know put them in the questions put them in the comments uh but thank you well two things really first off thank you to to remisa for coming and talking and sharing uh and, and sharing about all this um uh, but if you've got any questions, just just throw them in the chat, and in the last five or ten minutes, we'll we'll try and answer. Actually, Ramasi, you've got some calls to action that you were gonna you want. To share. That's correct. I will take it over from here and share again. So um, you can see my blue screen now, Adam. We can now, yeah. 
Awesome. So um, to quickly summarize, so um, we we also since Adam just uh, had a great demo today, so we also have a variety of example designs that you can use. Uh, that they include the operating system, power management, and graphic examples. And uh, the microblades example is included in the Vivado ML. So this can. Uh, I saw a couple of comments in the um, couple of questions and comments in the chat box about uh, whether um, can you use other boards than SP seven hundred one. And the answer is yes. You can use that with any of our uh, boards since it's supported to all of our devices. Um, for the demo, um, I um, I really like the demo. Thanks, Adam, for that. And um, I saw many questions in the chat about the whether the webinar and the demo will be available on demand. So the answer is yes, and we will share. Uh, it will be available on demand right after the webinar. All right, let's wrap up with a quick summary and the available collateral. So the one of the great uh, assets I want to share with you today is that. We actually learned that one of the biggest concerns for an embedded designer when adopting a different uh, platform is tools and the ease of use of the tools. So um, we recognized this and we pre-configured our environment and our evaluation boards to make it really easy for an embedded designer to bring up a microblaze design running Hello Word without having any FPGA uh, experience. So. This is the uh, Microblaze Processor Quick Start Guide. It's available on our website. You'll find the link into this slide, and it helps you get um, a Hello Word example in a few minutes. Next is that we are excited to announce our first Artex Ultrascale Plus evaluation kit. So we today we use the Spartan-based kits, the SP701. We, uh, we have two new kits that we just launched in the last couple of months. Uh, the first one is with our partner Opal Kelly. It's based on our AU25P, and uh, this is the largest AU Plus device that we have. And this kit comes with a complete onboard memory, programming uh, interfaces, and a six rapid prototyping interfaces with the CISG interfaces um, standards. The next board is uh, that we also recently launched. It's still, it will be available in quarter four, 2022. That's why the lead time for this one is um, is um, is high, but um, it's because it's currently in production, uh, going into production. So this is the Avnet board and uh, we partnered with Avnet. And as you can see, it's, it's extremely cheap. So uh, it's based on the ZU1CG and it's, um, it fits so many target application. It, it's currently now available for pre-order and there will be um, a free training, um, online training in quarter four as well, once it's, once it's available for shipping. For a quick summary, we highlighted the benefits of using the Microblaze today. And it's um, in brief, the um, programmable system integration the increasing the system performance and decreasing the bill of material cost, as well as decreasing the power and accelerating the design productivity. With that, I um, we documented here um, some of the um, the useful links that you can uh, quickly access through the slide. We'll also try to follow up with a Q and A. Um, or FAQ document, as well as um, some other links that you can find useful. So um, you can find some links here for our cost-optimized FPGAs and SOC portfolio, um, some links for to learn more about the Microblaze processor, and in order to purchase the uh, Opal Kelly board, the Avna board, and SB701 board, you'll have the links to that. And um, you can download our tools from the xilinx.com slash download, and you can learn more about the pricing and availability by contacting our local sale. And with that, make sure to follow uh, Adam, uh, the Adobe Engineering Blogs, and Hackster.io projects. You'll find so many other ideas that you can implement right away after this session. All right, I, I will turn it back to you, Adam, for a quick wrap up and uh, if we have any questions that we didn't cover. I think you are muted. I managed. I was typing away and managed to turn my to mute myself and turn the camera off instead of typing in the. In the <laughs> that happens uh, so, a lot. 
so uh so yeah so andrew andrew was asking uh, about typical sectors that we use the microblazing and you know the, the great thing about the microblazing i've worked across a range of applications from space to sort of you know industrial automotive military defense networking and i always find a lot of microblazers in no matter what application you do because it's just so it's just so versatile and so useful particularly if you if you're using um in particularly if you're using a lot of ip that have got axi interfaces on them you know just to configure processing pipelines uh, and things like that you know the microblazer is quite useful in in that area or a small microblazer is quite useful in that area or if you've got more complex things such as human machine interfaces and such like it's it's quite good so i i, I don't know if you want to add anything to it but i i i found it used across literally every application i've ever seen people people just seem to love microblazer it's, it's fantastic right uh, there is another question about the Vivado packages licensing and um, what are the licenses needed for running Microblaze. So Microblaze comes with royalty free. It's um, you can download since um, it's supported to all of our devices. So um, all of all of actually our cost optimized devices supports the Microblaze for free. So you can download it from our website. I added the link a couple of times and uh, I will add it to this question as well. Cool. Thanks, so, no, no problem. So, do you it? Yeah, it, it'll all be recorded and it'll all be online. If you go back to my, if you go, I'll, you can find it via this, by the same link you came to to watch this. But I'll put something on my, I'll put something on my uh, website as well, so that everybody can find everything nice and uh, nice and easily. Um, uh, somebody, somebody wants my email address. It is in the slides at the back of them all, um, and it's easy enough to find online. Uh, but here it is. Uh, so it's just in the it's just in the just in the chat now. Uh, Kumar, uh, we did some webinars last year actually on on the RFSOC. Uh, so if you drop me a if you drop me a message, uh, drop me an email, uh, I'll point you out where they were. We did that in partnership with Avnet and, and a few other companies, and I think they were uh, they were really quite well quite well received. I think the next one for this year is going to be on. Uh, we're going to take a look at Pedal Linux uh, next time. Uh, yep, and there is actually a question in the question boxes about the how does the microblaze fit into Pedal Linux system? So that's a good teaser, Adam, for the next one. It is. So, so the question is, right you'll, 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 you'll have to come back and we can, and we can, and we can show <laughs> you how to do it. The reality is it's actually quite simple. Like like many things in the Xilinx ecosystem, it's actually quite simple. So you just configure the, and, and I'm just using the engineering word just, because when you say just, it makes it sound like so easy. But you just configure the microblaze for the Linux, as it's got the MMU and such like on there. Uh, you can export that. And then just like you do with any other, like if you're working with a Zinc or a Zinc MPSOC or Reversal, you can just create a PEC Linux project and target uh, and target the target that XSE that contains the, contains the microblaze. Uh, you do need a Linux machine though. Uh, uh, to get you to get that up and to get that up and running, but once you've once you've got that, uh, then it's okay. Awesome! Uh, it looks like so many are interested to attend this webinar, so that's awesome. So, another question here about the difference between the Zinc MP SSC and Microblaze. I will put this slide on the um, on the presentation mood again. So. Um, it's actually, it's a really good question. So um, with Zynx, you, so as you can see here, that microblaze is with all of our devices. But what's the difference with Zynx that you can have extra processing, uh, extra processing with the ARM Cortex. So um, it's um, with Zynx 7000, the ARM Cortex A9 is supported. Uh, Zynx Ultra Scale Plus, there is more complicated ARMs, both on the A53 uh, and the RF, uh, the R5F. And with Versal, it's um, it's more and more complicated with the A72 processor. So, um, yeah, you can um, you can easily choose whatever fits your application, and with all of the devices, you can get the microblaze. Yeah, I think that's a great that's a great answer, Amisa. So, someone was just asking about an IP. I, could I do a blog that shows R5 to microblaze? I don't know if I've done that. If I if I have, I'll uh, if I have, I'll I'll I'll, I'll highlight it somewhere on, on LinkedIn or something. If not, I will um, 
I will create one because I think it could be quite. I think that could be quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting blog. Um, Tiber, the microblaze is not. You're not going to be able to implement it in a in a in an ASIC. Uh, it's it's it uses Xilinx as it uses. Uh, you know, it calls up parameters that are that are associated with the Xilinx FPJ IP. Uh, so it's not just sort of logic and So it's not. Um, it's not portable outside of the Xilinx ecosystem, shall we say. Right. If there's nothing else, I will say thank you very, thank you very much uh, for attending. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, see you uh, soon with the Peta Linux webinar. Um, we will see you webinar. soon. With, uh, <laughs> we will see you soon with, with we will see you soon with Peta Linux webinar. And and thank you, thank you very, thank you very much, for everybody. I've been uh, I've really enjoyed doing this. Apologies, Bravado crashed in the middle, uh, but I've really enjoyed <laughs> doing this today. It's been it's been fantastic, uh, and I'm really you know the the engagement from the audience has been fantastic, asking questions and everything. So it's really uh, really kept me on my uh, kept me on my toes. So with that, right. I will say thank you very much, and I will I will end this event. Uh, but thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks everyone for attending. Thanks, Adam. Thank you.